Hello and welcome everyone to the second podcast covering chapters 26 for day 30. In this, um, in this podcast, we're going to talk about objectives 3 and 2. We may put in objective uh, 4 as well. I'm going to talk about objective 3 first because I think understanding ancestral and derived characters first is, is more convenient um, before you start talking about homoplasy and homology. So let's go ahead and get started. Let's first compare and contrast a ancestral and derived traits. So let's write ancestral. This is a trait that that a taxon has in common, or I should say, or a group of taxa have in common. Whereas a derived trait is a trait that is an evolutionarily new trait in a taxon or a group of taxa. So let's go ahead and draw a simple cladogram to explain this. Where we have taxa A, B, C, and D. Let's say both C and D shared a trait. And we don't need to worry about what trait that is. For now, our next example, we'll worry about that. But let's just say they shared a trait. If two taxa share a trait, and so we say it's an ancestral trait. Let's have a different example up here. Let's say there's another trait, not the same trait, but a different trait, that B has, so we'll say yes to B, and A does not. We say then that B has derived this trait since the common ancestor. So we say it's a derived trait. Again, we say that because the same member of its taxa group here does not have the trait. So it's a derived trait. Now I'm going to move to a PowerPoint slide to explain this using a different figure. All right, let's look at this figure from your textbook. It's figure 2612. In this figure, you'll see a group of taxa, Lancelot, Lamprey, Bass, Frog, Turtle, and Leopard. And then you'll see a list of characteristics, hair, amnion, four walking legs, hinge jaw, vertebral column. And when we look at these, we can say which ones are ancestral and which ones are derived. And sometimes it depends on which organisms we're comparing. For instance, when we look at a turtle and a leopard, we can see that a leopard has hair and a turtle does not. Since they're in the same taxa group here, we can say that hair is a derived characteristic compared to the turtles. So in this case, it's derived. In comparing a leopard and a turtle, they both have an amnion. You can't see this that in this picture, but an amnion is a part of the embryonic development. Both reptiles and mammals share that. So they have this in common. Since they have it in common, we say this is an ancestral trait comparing the leopard and the turtle. Now, if we were to compare the leopard and the frog, then we would say that the amnion is a derived trait. That's what I meant when I said that it depends on which groups you're comparing. So again, the frog does not have an amnion, and the leopard does. Therefore, their common ancestor, so again, this is the common ancestor of the frog and the leopard. Their common ancestor did not have an amnion. So let's look at the four walking legs. We can see that a frog, a turtle, and a leopard all have four legs. Since they all have this trait, we say in this regards, it's an ancestral trait. However, when we compare, say, a turtle with a bass, shown here, which doesn't have four walking legs, then we say that these four walking legs are a derived trait compared to the bass. Again, say that again, four walking legs is an ancestral trait 
for the frog, turtle, and leopard. But for the turtle and bass, we would say that the four walking legs is a derived characteristic with the turtles. We get to do the same with the hinged jaws. Bass, frog, turtle, leopard all share this ancestral trait of a hinged jaw. However, this is a derived trait of these organisms when you compare it to a lamprey or a lancelot. The vertebral column, in this case, is an ancestral trait for the lamprey, bass, frog, turtle, and leopard. It's a derived trait compared to the lancelot. So you should be able to look at a figure here, such as this, and be able to determine which of these traits are derived or ancestral, and in what in comparison to which group. Okay, now I want to talk about the terms homology and homoplasy. Homology are characters that are similar due to a descent from a common ancestor. So for instance, if we had a cladogram over here, a simple one, where both these taxa, A and B, had a trait that was similar, it would be because of this shared common ancestor here. So we would say that the traits are homologous. We would also say they are ancestral traits. This can get kind of confusing because some of the words seem to kind of blend together and they have very similar meanings. The other term here is homoplasy. These are characters similar due to independent evolution. or what we called earlier convergent evolution. So we could draw a simple cladogram here. Where we have organisms A, B, C, and D. And a trait that's due to homoplasy would be a trait that is present in A, I'm just going to put a dot here, it is a derived trait that occurred in the evolution of A, and we also see it in D. It's a common trait found in both A and D, but not B and C. Therefore we say it is caused by independent evolution or convergent evolution. Now you might have thought, well why couldn't it have appeared here and then just disappeared along the way? That is a, a possibility, but I want to introduce another term for you called parsimony. Parsimony is the least number of steps needed to construct a phylogeny. So the reason we say this is due to homoplasy or independent evolution is because it only took two independent evolutionary events to occur to get this trait in both A and D. If the structures were homologous due to a common ancestor, we would have had the trait appear here so I'll put a plus here because it would have appeared there. And then we would have had to have lost it here and lost it here. Because remember, oh, I said that wrong. We would have had to have lost it here. Because we said the trait was in A and D. So in order for it to the, this trait to have been homologous, we would have had to have had three independent events, which is less likely than having it be independent evolution, convergent evolution, and have it in it appear twice. Two independent evolutionary events is more likely than three independent evolutionary events. Now I want to go and do a couple more examples on the PowerPoint slide. Alright, another good example of looking at 
or determining if a trait is due to homology or due to homoplasy, is looking at the evolution of the eye. In this figure here, we see four animals. We see an octopus, a ray fin fi fish, a crocodile, and a hippopotamus. These animals are all quite different. However, we see they all have some kind of eye structure. We say that the octopus and the ray fin fish have camera eyes. And the crocodile and hippopotamus, they also have eyes, but they're quite different. They are eyes that sit up top of the skull here. We say that these two eyes, octopus and ray fin fish, and then the eyes of the crocodile and hippopotamus, arose due to convergent evolution. So let's go ahead and try to figure this out real quick. In this phylogenetic tree, we see a list of organisms on the top, some of which have eyes, some of which don't. And if the eye arose due to homo homology, that is the eyes are homologous, this is what would have had to have happened. We know that the common ancestor to all of them is right here. We know that the branch that led to the worms, the acelomate worms, does not have an eye. We know that the rotifers don't have an eye. We know the flatworms don't, and we know the segmented worms don't. But we know the mollusks do, like the octopus here. So in order to achieve just this much of the tree, the eyes would have had to have originated here. So that's one event. The eyes would have had to been lost here. That's another event. Well, let's just write two. That's our second event. The eyes would have also had to have lost here. And that's a third event. The eyes would have had to lost been lost here. That's a fourth event. And finally, nothing else would have happened here because they would have already been there. So we would have had to have had four events so far. Now we know that the roundworms and the arthropods, like the typical roundworm you're used to seeing, as well as arthropods like the lobsters, they don't have an eye. And so because of that, they would have had to lost it here. So that's our fifth event. Then as we move up this branch, we know the echinoderms that branch off don't have an eye. So that's our sixth event. It would have had to have lost the eyes there. And we know the vertebrates do have an eye. So if the eye structure is homologous, then we would have had to, ha would have, had, to have had six independent evolutionary events to have occurred, which is possible. However, if we look at the same phylogenetic tree, but this time say that the eye is the result of convergent evolution, that is through homoplasy, then we can see that there was no eye that formed here early on. That was a much later evolutionary trait. And so because of that, you wouldn't have had to have lost the eye here or lost the eye features here or here. Instead, you would have just have had to have gained it one time here. So that's one. And then the arthropods and roundworms, they wouldn't have had to have lost it. So that's all good. And then again, we'd have to have gained it here as vertebrates evolved. So two independent events is much less than the five or six we saw in the last slide. So it's more likely that this trait is the result of convergent evolution. In addition, our, the fossil records would also, have, would also support this parsimonious view of the evolution of the eyes. Again, each of these evolutionary steps, the gaining of an eye, is a very big evolutionary step. Would have required a very long time to have occurred. Likewise, losing the eye would have also taken a very long time to have lost. Therefore, it's, we always take the fewest number of events that are necessary. And this is, again, what we call parsimony. Okay, I'm going to give you this true-false question on your own, to do on your own. The question is, the wings of owls and bats are homologous. That is that they arose due to a shared ancestor having wings. So if you think that's the case, indicate true. And if you think it, they, the wings arose due to convergent evolution and that they are analogous structures, indicate that it is false. To help answer this question, go back and look at how we analyze the appearance of eyes throughout evolution. I can tell you what the answer is in class tomorrow. Up to this point, we've talked about certain characteristics and traits that we can observe in different species and how we build phylogenetic trees based upon that. Well, we also know that organisms change at the genomic level, and we can follow that as well. To talk about that, I'm going to use a term called homologous genes. And as you might be able to guess, 
these are genes that share a common evolutionary ancestry. Okay, so these homologous genes, they share this common evolutionary ancestry. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's take this gene called enolase. Enolase codes an enzyme called enolase. Happens to be my favorite enzyme. In yeast, there is one enolase gene. In humans, there's also this same enolase gene. Humans also have two other enolase genes. They're all homologous. All four of these genes we would say are homologous genes of the gene enolase. We can further characterize homologous genes by saying that they are either orthologous or paralogous. Orthologous genes are called homologous genes that are in different species. Paralogous genes are homologous genes in the same species. So in our example of the enolase gene, we can say that enolase gene 1 in yeast and enolase gene 1 in humans are orthologous. So these two together are orthologous. Whereas the human genes, 1, 2, and 3, they're in the same species, so they are paralogous. The way I often distinguish these in my mind is I think of ortho, and that reminds me of the word other, and so I know that orthologous genes are homologous genes in other organisms, in different species. But I just focus on the word ortho for other. And I remember paralogous or, um, genes because these genes have to result because of a gene duplication where you copy that gene and make a second copy of it. And so when you make that second copy, you have a pair of genes or paralogous genes. They can further develop more than two. In some cases, we may have 50 or more paralogous genes in one organism. This is very common. Okay, so that ends this podcast, and it ends the material for day 30 and chapter 26. If you have any questions, please let me know. Now, because my dad's down recording, I can watch TV. Good luck.